Good morning and welcome to this time of worship, a time when on a glorious Sunday morning we come with hearts ready to praise God and give thanks for days like this. And we give thanks for one another that we've come to take this time to be together as God's family to worship, praise, and have fellowship together. Welcome to this time at South Frankfurt Presbyterian Church. You could probably guess and probably know that I am not Marion McClure Taylor, <laughs> but I am Jim Garrett and, it's happy, and I'm so happy to be back with you today. As Marion's on study leave and finishing that time of refreshment and renewal, so we all come back ready to see God again. But being a, a visitor and with you this morning, of course, I'm not as in tune with the life of the congregation. So let me ask if there are announcements which need to be made this morning. Then let us worship God. Inspired by the psalmist, we come to worship God. Come, all who need help. Our help comes from God, the one who made heaven and earth. Come, all who desire blessing. Our blessing comes from God, the God of Abraham, the God of the angels. Come, all who long for salvation.
Hear this word from the Gospel of John. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We can, with confidence, approach God in confession, knowing that we are not condemned, but God seeks to save us. So then, in confidence, let us pray together. Eternal source and goal of all life, we come before you as people lost, in need of a savior, sinful in need of forgiveness, condemned in need of mercy. God of salvation, you shower our lives and our world with love, yet we turn away from your blessing. It is easy to complain. There are annoyances each day and we pile them into a mountainous burden which becomes a curse on our lives. When we are burdened or distracted or confused, redirect our attention to the abundant opportunities to experience your love. During this Lenten journey, focus our hearts on you that we may choose blessing offered us each day through Jesus Christ in whom we pray. And again, hearing from the Gospel of John in chapter 3, For God so loved the world that God gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Friends, in this Gospel passage, we have the assurance that the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And so I declare to you that in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
I love your hats. They're fabulous. <laughs> Some of you like them more than others. Oh, Lucky Charms. Oh, that's great. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some things today. So how many of you all, when you remember like your first day of school, remember your first day of school? Yeah. It was, do you remember it was kind of scary the first day of school? No? Well, it's scary for parents, I can promise you. But usually your parents walk you in and they, you know, and they take you to school. Uh, what about the first time you ever went swimming? Did you just like jump into the water with nobody there to catch you? Or were your parents there to catch you? <laughs> yeah, I think they usually are there to, ch to catch you, right? Or the first time you rode a bike, a two-wheel bike, did somebody kind of walk alongside of you so you can ride the bike? I'm telling you, you all are an independent group of children. <laughs> all right. All right, I need a volunteer who's willing to be blindfolded. All right, come on, Hayes, you can do it. All right, I'm going to blindfold you, and I want you uh, to walk over there to Mr. Moore. He's going to raise his hand, and I want you to get me a tissue, okay? All right, can you see? All right. Well, um, how about if I help you, okay? Can you see? All right, I'm going to take, this is what, when people are really blind, they take somebody's arm like this, and they walk with them like this, right? Okay, so hold on. Just trust me that I'm going to. There's Mr. Moore right here. Let's get a tissue. Get the tissue. All right, very good. Now we're going to walk back. All right. So if you thought that you had to do that by yourself, that would have been really scary, right? <laughs> you kind of were holding your breath. Did you even realize you were doing that? Yeah, well, you were. Well, our Bible story today is about a man named Abram. And God said to him in our Bible story today, he said, Abram, I want you to just leave this country. I want you to follow me and just leave this country. Well, he didn't even tell Abram where he was going. But God said, you have to trust me. You have to trust me. And so that's what we want to remember today is that when we try something new, sometimes it can be kind of scary. But if we ask God and trust in God, then he's going to be for it, there for us and he's going to help us. All right? Okay. All right, let's say a prayer. Father, sometimes we are afraid to go where we have not gone before. Help us to remember that you are there with us wherever we go. Amen. Let's turn around. And let's uh, send the children with a blessing. Turn, stand up. Stand up and turn around. God be with you. God be with us all. All right. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so the first lesson for this morning comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Hear this word of God. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went. As the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. This ends the lesson from the Old Testament. From the New Testament, we'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. 
Hear also this word of the Lord. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicholas said to him, How can anyone be born after growing old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to Jesus, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This ends the lessons for this morning. May God give us understanding at this, the word of the Lord. The season of Lent is a time of movement. It's a time when we change and move and go in different ways and directions, but it is a time of movement. We often talk about this Lenten season, these 40 days that we're in now, as a time of journey, the journey of Lent. The journey begins. Where are we today? Where do we want to be? And even in some of our traditions of Lent, those traditions that we see coming from other church traditions of giving up something, of sacrificing, it's to move us to a different place, to allow us to think and move towards God. And it is so good that this Lenten journey happens at the same time that in our world we're in this time of movement and thinking. Think about this. It's springtime. We're thinking about moving around, maybe planning a spring vacation, a spring trip. What will summer bring to us? We may be thinking about where we will go to, for Easter. Who is going to come see us at Easter? Yes, these days are days of movement. These days that were January going into February and March. Now, January, February, March, as I think about growing up, there was something that indicated to, to me and to much of us, uh, many of us in society, that it was a time of movement. Do you remember watching on TV sometime in February and March the cinematic marvel that was brought to us in our homes of watching The Wizard of Oz? Do you remember those days when there were just those three stations, CBS, NBC, ABC, and maybe one independent station, and there were those special times when we gathered around as a family to watch what this special would be, this special presentation? And so it was with The Wizard of Oz. Now, it started first broadcast in 1956, but it wasn't until 1959 and then going forward all the way to 91 that we could look for the Wizard of Oz, that special time. First started in those couple years in December, but it kind of migrated into February and March. You know, the year really didn't begin 
until we had the Wizard of Oz. Those days before, even the Super Bowl was as big as it is, and that kind of marked the new beginning of a year in January, or now slipping into early February. It was the Wizard of Oz. We gathered as family. Each year we saw again, as we were preparing as a society, of course, uh, you know, in the higher church traditions always had Lent. We've recently, more recently, discovered it in the Presbyterian Church and other Protestant churches. But we started our journey. Of course, you remember the story of Dorothy, who was having anxiety and problems at home with her aunt and uncle and was uh, chasing after Toto because of the mean neighbor that didn't like Toto. And then she's caught up in the wind, caught up in the wind and lands in this magical place called Oz, but didn't know it at first. Do you remember the year, it was about 1965, when we were all starting to get color TVs, and, and, and it was advertised that it's going to be seen in color. I remember that, that hearing stories of that time, we didn't have a color TV, only a few people around us did, but they were so excited because they were going to see the Wizard of Oz in color. And they were so upset because it seemed to be broadcasting in black and white forgetting that that's how the director had made that film, that time in Kansas when, when Dorothy was, was, was on her bicycle uh, trying to get, or walking and trying to get away from Toto and, and the, the mean neighbor was putting Toto in a basket and on a bicycle and there was movement, but it was dark. It was black and white. And it wasn't until that moment when she landed in Oz, the door of her house opened and the world was seen in full color, 1965. But there was all kinds of movement, and of course, Dorothy had to catch up with what was happening, walking out there in the, in the, in the munchkin land and trying to figure out where she was when Glinda appeared. I started to talk to her, and then she learned the story that her house had landed on the Wicked Witch of the East, and, and all Dorothy wanted to do, though, was to go home to be at home. How do I get there? And Glinda had to tell her that she didn't know, but perhaps the great wizard of Oz could get her back home. And she wanted to go find this wizard. And so comes that question of movement and journey. How do I get to see the wizard? Oh, but you follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. She looked around and about in the film to find the beginning of the road. Do you remember how Dorothy started there with the munchkins all around her? She had to find the beginning of the road and it was a little narrow spiral. And she starts walking along the road. The munchkins become voices telling her, follow the yellow brick road, follow the yellow brick road. She was beginning her journey to a place called home. But what was interesting as she begins the journey is that in her innocence, she heard Glinda say, just follow the yellow brick road. And in trust, she did. Well, if this is what I'm to do, then let me go do that and be about that. Let me follow the yellow brick road. And so she starts her spiral. And as she begins to leave the land of the munchkins, as she walks by her house, which had brought, been brought on wind, and right beside the, or on the other side of the yellow brick road from the house was this pond, this water. There's a fountain there and a river moving. Wind had brought her house. She walks by water as she starts her journey on the yellow brick road. We watched it every year in this time of Lenten journey. Follow the yellow brick road. This morning in the scripture, we hear of a man named Abram, later Abraham, who was told by God to get up and go. Go to the land that I will show you. And it's interesting to me that there's some comparison, some draw that we can see with Dorothy starting out on her journey saying, I don't know where I'm going, except she was told it was a land far away and quite a journey to get there. Abraham got up to go, not knowing quite where God would lead, but knowing that he had to be about that leading. Now for Abraham, he trusted in a good God, a God that said, I will give you blessing. 
I will make of you a great nation. He hears these things and can begin to trust this God that followed him, that was close to him, near him, that would be with him on the journey, obviously watching. For I will bless those who you bless, curse those who curse you. Clearly, God was paying attention, and Abraham could get up and go. There are a series of promises from God that we hear in this short scripture from Genesis that gives the basic shape for the follow or, or the story that follows promises of land and blessing, promises to shape Israel into a great nation with a great name. The focus of the divine blessing, however, is not solely for the future or for the benefit of Israel's future, but for the sake of all the families of the earth who will rise up and call you blessed. The promises move beyond Israel and bring the entire world, the world which this God had created, into view. Abraham, 75 years old, was given great promise because Abraham went on a journey with God. Now, we take the story of Abraham and put that alongside another story of another man who ventured out one night to go find Jesus. The story of Nicodemus, who went in the dark of night to find Jesus. And we wonder so much about what that could be. Now, just a little bit with this darkness and this time. You know, we know that Nicodemus is, 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 of a, is, a, is a leader of the synagogue, probably a, a Pharisee of some sort. And, and so he was venturing out uh, to see this Jesus, this new leader that they had all been suspicious of. Well, not just suspicious. The story before we're introduced to Nicodemus is the story of, of Jesus purging, cleansing the temple. Uh, talk about a story. What about this guy that came into the temple and overthrew the tables and pulled out whips and chased the money changers out? That's happened in the Gospel of John right before Nicodemus comes. So yes, perhaps he wanted to come in that dark of night so that others may not see him in conversation with Jesus, asking Jesus, what, what, is, what is happening here? What's going on? Who are you? Nicodemus would, would start by saying, we know, we know, we know of the signs, we, we, we know of the things you've done, which again is very interesting in, in the Gospel of John where this is placed. After all, Jesus had done two major things besides calling the disciples, pretty important in itself, but what he had done was cleanse the temple and change water into wine. And yet there were reports of Jesus, we know of your signs, we know of your signs. Yet Nicodemus was there at night. Now a very interesting thing happens in the Gospel of John when we think about night and darkness. Do you remember as the Gospel of John started that the Word came and the Word was of God and the Word was light? The Word was light. If I continued to read in the Gospel of John beyond verse 17, hear what John has to write in verse 19. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. And John, his contrast between light and darkness is very, very important. Darkness was the place where there was not the presence of God. Darkness was the place where light had not shined. So it's somewhat significant that Nicodemus would come at night in a period of darkness. Now, he may be wanting to cover himself and not be seen by other Pharisees, but maybe it's a way of expressing he was not feeling close to God, was missing something. There was a separation from God, not in God's presence, not in God's light. I find it interesting, too, that as he has made his journey to find Jesus, there was some expectation that Jesus, light of the world, would be found in darkness. I see some people write about Nicodemus coming to, to, to 
Jesus here at night, and they say, well, in the middle of the night. We don't know what time it was, but I'm still struck that there was an expectation that Nicodemus would find Jesus at some point, that Jesus, the presence of God, would be available when most people would be asleep. So what brought Nicodemus there? What was going on in his mind? What made him begin a journey, a trip, a movement back to God? How did Nicodemus find him? Did he know where to go in the middle of the night? Did Nicodemus plan his excursion? Did he go on a whim, unable to sleep? Maybe his mind racing, figuring this, trying to figure this out, his soul restless and urging him to find the teacher from God? Well, in some ways, if he came in that way. It's what we talk about in our Lenten journey, this urge to find God, to go back to God, to find our home. No place like home in the presence of God, in the presence of light. And so Nicodemus begins to ask, tell me, Jesus. Jesus says to him, you must be born from above. Now, in other translations of the Bible and of this gospel, you will have known and heard through time that sometimes this phrase from above is also translated born again, born anew, born again, which, of course, when we talk about born again is somewhat problematic for us in the Presbyterian Church. That's not a term that we use a lot, but the original Greek word that's used here, it's called anathen, can be translated from above, again, anew. But all this idea that there has to be a change, something's going to be different from the way you were to the way you will be. There's movement here as we move into the light, into the very light of God. The movement is there. And so Nicodemus is thinking very earthly-like, very earthly-like, saying, what, can someone enter again into a mother's womb to be born again? This makes no sense. And Jesus is trying to, to get him to understand we're thinking about heavenly things, spiritual things. Even Jesus would ask, if I, we speak of you of earthly things and you do not understand, how can you as a teacher of Israel begin to understand spiritual and heavenly things? What this is for Nicodemus is an invitation to give up his rigid thinking of how religion should be and how it should work. Now, as a leader and teacher of the faith, he probably figured, Nicodemus figured, that he had things all worked out. Well, if you act this way, then this is how you get God's blessing. If you act th another way, then you get God's curses. As if everything was very clear and in a theological box, that we've got this all sorted out, and this is how God moves and is seen and experienced in the world. But Jesus is inviting them to see something different, with light shining into all the dark places of the, of the world and of the earth and into the dark places of the human heart. For Jesus is here to remind us that this light shines everywhere, on every one, in every place. There is no place to go where you can be absent from the presence of God and that the divine blessings are extended to everyone. Yes, what Jesus is saying is if you are willing to be born from above in the spirit, then you will see God working in new ways, different ways, ways outside the synagogue, ways outside the temple, ways where people gather together. The Pharisees, and even religious leaders today, may have seen that being in charge, being the ones in power, gave them some type of authority to, to render blessing that somehow they had the tight control on the divine. And, and, and that gave them power, and it gave them worldly status. They could make decisions on behalf of others, mediate who would be blessed 
and who would not be blessed, and who would be seen as having the blessings of God, and who didn't have those blessings. But Jesus is telling him, it's different. If you go to, on a journey with God, you will be born from above, spirit and water, spirit that blows. Remember singing the song, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Afresh on Me? Jesus is inviting Nicodemus into that kind of relationship, to be open to a spirit of God that falls fresh on us. But if that spirit falls fresh on us, then we see light, love, movement back towards God. There is no place like home. It's how Dorothy starts out on her journey, looking for that place called home. Do you remember at the end of the story of, of the Wizard of Oz and of Dorothy? You know, she finds the wizard, of course, and then is sent on the task to go get the witch's broom. And we learn then when she brings the broom back that the wizard really isn't all that wizardry at all. He had no power to send her home. He had no way to do that. He was caught in his fraud when the curtain was pulled back. And there he was, the wizard, admittedly saying that, well, I sent you on that journey thinking you would never, ever come back. And that's the way I would be done with you. And so there was disappointment. Disappointment. But yet there were blessings along the way. There was a, a diploma given for the one who needed a brain, a heart for the one who needed a, a, uh, a, a heart that needed a heart, and courage, a medal given to the one who needed courage. Things that Dorothy and the others needed to learn, but that what they were learning is what Glinda then came and told them, coming again in that little ball of light when she lands after the balloon left and Dorothy was left alone and caught in Oz, Glenda tells her, you always had the power to go home. But if I told you this in the beginning, you would not have believed it. You had to go on the journey. She had to discover that there was no place like home. And by simply tapping her shoes together, saying there's no place like home, she get, made it back to Kansas. Now, I bring the ending of the story, even in the light of Nicodemus, to say, well, there is no place like home with God. What Nicodemus was beginning to learn through the words of Jesus is that it, from above, a spirit of God, light shining around us, we have the presence of God. That Nicodemus and others may have thought that God could have been boxed in into some kind of theological once and done principle. This is the way it is and the way it shall be. And there are those who are left out and there are those who have made it in. But, but what he's beginning to learn in this discussion with Jesus is that there are new ways new ways to be discovered. But like Abraham, the new way is grounded in the reality that we journey with God, that in God we have a place called home, always trusting that. And from that base and foundation, we're willing to make our journey, to start again in the Lenten season and every sentence, in every season, to say again to God, lead me, mold me, Shake me, use me. But knowing there'll be a journey that'll have its pitfalls, its struggles, its joys, its happiness. We journey to a place called home. Nicodemus came at night. Nicodemus walked into a new morning. May your Lenten journey, as you look for that place called home, be one where you find God with you, 
always, forever. Amen. trying to think of something funny to say with <laughs> but let me say this God has shown us the meaning of generosity in the beautiful diversity of creation and the overflowing love of Jesus Christ and in the never ending gift of the Holy Spirit God has abundantly blessed us blessed us on our journey blessed us and called us to be a community that blesses others through the sharing of our love, our talents, and our material possessions. Let us rejoice in what we have been given and in what is ours to give as we receive the morning offering. Sorry, I need to ask as a visitor. I know uh, we were accustomed to following the bulletin. Do we sing the doxology, even though it's not in there? Okay, thank you. You can sing it in your heart. <laughs> <laughs> then in that spirit of thankfulness and in gratitude and hopes and in joys, let us turn to God in a time of prayer and let us pray together. Most gracious God, you have given us the gifts which we know through the moving strains of music, through a smile and a tear, a sigh and a shout, through laughter and weeping, a prayer, silence, the beauty of such a day like this and a place like this. God, for these gifts and the meaning of them for each of us, know our gratitude and our expressions of praise. We pray for your church, O oh God, sometimes triumphant and present, while at other times seeming to be failing in distance. Sometimes we are together and at one, uniting the variety of parts that we are to include even the smallest into a whole that transcends our limits and boundaries. And at other times we may seem to be scattered and divided, torn and hurting, afraid and self-righteous. 
Sometimes we are truly serving, while at other times we demand and want only to be served. But in all these times, O oh God, remind us that we are on a journey as your people, as your congregation, as your great and grand worldwide church to a place called home, the place that you have promised, the place that you intend to see upon this earth. And so sometimes we are filled with your spirit, which enlivens, empowers, and transforms, while at other times we may be only a skeleton of that that, that settles for what it is, afraid and yes, and maybe unwilling to take those first steps on the road that you would have before us. O Holy One, your spirit catches us and fills us and frees us. Flow through us, inspire us, help us in our own personal struggles, our concerns, and be with us as we look at the world around us, knowing that it needs your love, your light. Help us to be transcendent people and help us to be open to the moving of your spirit so that we may see new ways, new teachings, new opportunities to show your love in the world that needs us. Help us to be your church, to appreciate the gifts which we are given and share them gratefully that there may be a stronger, serving, enlivening, empowering, and transforming body in this world, your church proclaimed. So bless, dear God, this congregation and the worldwide church of which we are part. Forgive us when we think of ourselves first, and forgive us for the foolish pride that we sometimes feel, both expressed openly and secretly, that ours is better, that ours is more faithful, that ours is the way, while at the same time we know our gratitude for the freedom and variety that we enjoy as members of this church. We pray for the world, this one world in which we live, one in which there is abundance and yet limits, one in which there is food and yet hungry people, one in which there is healing and yet hurting, one in which there is peace and yet war. We pray for the world which you so love that you sent us the Christ to believe, to trust and to follow, that there might be life and freedom forever, yet there is unbelief. Help us in our unbelief. Forgive us and help us to truly to believe that by so believing we will hope and by so hoping we will do what needs to be done until there is enough for all in just proportions, until justice and mercy shall rain down. In our sovereign God, may there be peace. And so finally we ask that we have peace in our lives, be with those who are struggling, be with those who are at this ease, be with those who are hurting. Be with those who are grieving. Be with us that we may find your peace, know your peace, and live in your peace. You know the particular concerns that lie heaviest in our hearts and minds. Receive our silent prayers as we offer them to you. And so, gracious God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who in compassion has helped the helpless and harassed crowd, sent out his disciples with words of hope and deeds and love. We thank you for Christ who comes to us in the dark night of our souls when we feel less present to you. We look around us today and at the same depths of human need. We know that you send us out with good news now, that you send us on a road, a journey, filled with your good news. We humbly and joyfully accept your mission, trusting in Jesus Christ to give us courage and strength, a heart and the minds to do what you would have us do. And we are thankful through Jesus Christ who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen. And so now we go into the world in peace. Continue your journey, walking in love. Care for one another. Care for the earth. Seek justice and make peace. God goes before you. God calls you. God does not abandon you. Remember this. Christ is the way. Follow and find freedom. Christ is the life. Receive and rejoice. Christ is the truth. Seek sure that those who seek find. Go, knowing that you walk in the light. Go forth to be a community that unbinds for the sake of wholeness, that all might have life in abundance. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>